How many days did you spend shooting the film? We shot on bubble for 18 days, but in sort of it was designed to to be shot in one big chunk, then a couple days off for me to edit. Then a couple more days of shooting, a couple more days to edit, then a couple more days of shooting. So it was sort of 13, 12 or 13 days initially, then two days of editing, two more days of shooting. You know, this little checkerboard near the end so that uh, we could all sit down. We would watch the movie a lot because I would cut every night. We'd just transfer the HD right into my computer and and cut. Was there anyone assembling things for you or you just literally did it yourself? No, I just did it myself at night in the hotel room. On a computer? Or on, uh, I had an I Avid, Avid Express, Avid, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. And so the day we wrapped our last, last, last day of shooting, uh, that night we watched the whole film and sort of talked about it and, and made some we? notes. Of uh, everybody who worked on it. We had everybody. There Not were only, the actors though. Uh, no, I waited for them to see it until a little later. But um, the 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 crew, which was total, probably between the shooting crew and the office, twenty people. Now let's jump into this uh, the whole issue of shooting on HD and the whole topic of film versus digital and what your experience has been of that. What cameras did you uh, system did you use on? This? We used the uh, the Sony Cine Alta nine fifty. Um, which I found I really liked. Um, I found them really they're really easy to use, and I thought the images were were really terrific. Where except for uh, the aforementioned uh, blue light and that one green light outside of Kyle's trailer, we had no we never used any lights anywhere. So this scene here in the lunchroom. This is all just what it is. Everything is available light. It's just there's lights in the ceiling and the window light. Yeah. So you have a mix of daylight and tungsten. And here. what's great, yeah, and what's great is you can you can obviously look through the viewfinder and decide, what, yeah, what color temperature you want to go with in that specific location. You can switch between four different filters. Did you have a monitor, or you were no, looking, we just no monitor really? No. We had one. We had one monitor out near the um, the sound card, and exposure. You know, you can sort of just dial it in and make it look. Um, the so, way if you there want were multiple look. cameras on on some scenes, what were you looking at? You were just I'd watching the actors. Through, I'd be looking through one camera. One of the cameras. And Greg uh, Jacobs would usually be operating the other so camera. So, not having monitors on the set was an effort to just keep things uh, light. Or yeah. Yeah. Just didn't feel it was necessary. Mm-mm. And sometimes if we felt like there was something weird going on that we needed to check, we would go back to the sound card and rerun something and make sure we there wasn't a problem. I noticed that like some of the light, the continuity of the light was really very precise. Like there's a, you know, when they're going to work for the first time and it's pre-dawn, then it's dawn, then when they're in the parking lot, it's, you know, just sunrise and the light is very uh, low on the horizon. There's long shadows. Like I thought that was very carefully done. Well, I feel I'm sh- I know from seeing your movie and seeing your videos that you know you feel the same as I do, which is those are those make a difference. Time of day is very very important, uh, especially in a movie. I think. Um, well, you're always after plausibility, basically, and people, you know, step out of the movie and go, "Oh, I don't believe this." At, with the, at the smallest thing. It doesn't have to be a 555 number that just seems phony, but it's just like, well, it's supposed to be morning, and then they're coming to work, but the sun seems like it's in the... It's noon. It's noon, so it's just what that's wrong. No, and the luxury of shooting on this sort of budget and and with this sort of schedule is that we were able to, to be really precise about that stuff. For instance, the shot just previous to the one we're looking at now with Martha and her dad... I remember getting up on a ladder and waiting quite a while for the sun to reach a certain point so that the shadow was at a certain point so that you felt like it was 5, 5.30. And we did that a lot. And I think it it not only makes a difference in the film, but it actually is something that these cameras respond to very well. They're really, I think they come up with really terrific imagery in that well the magic hour is usually with film is 15 minutes and with these cameras it's like what it's like 40 minutes it felt like it yeah Yeah. because again you could you could you could manipulate it a little bit on set and and get it more where you wanted um 
Now, I want to ask you a question. Let's say you're working with these non-professional actors who are very good, but the scene is not working or the scene isn't going in the direction that you need it to. How did you actually, when if you ever needed to actually direct them, how did you direct them? Or did it never come up? It, not very often. There would be, for instance, in the bar scene that we just watched, I remember saying one thing to Misty. I just said, look, you're... You're sizing him up as a potential mark, so you need to really stare at him, like really look at him. In the bar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and she said, okay, okay. And she knew exactly, like the next day she knew exactly what I was talking about, and she did it. Great. I said, you know, you got you to gotta study him. I felt like she wasn't looking at him enough. That was, that was really the extent of, of my quote-unquote direction, because they... So much of their own backstories had been incorporated into the characters, and so much of what they say in the film is based on their own experience that um, they were they were right right in the right place. Was there any sort of did you just sort of start in making the film with them like the first day there was a scene and you shot it, or was there any sort of I know there must not have been a rehearsal process no but was there discussions about the overall i I met with each goals? of them um individually and just talked about um, how this was going to work, in, in literally how this was going to work, how we like to work and what the environment was going to be like. Um, and then we had a little, before, just before we started shooting, we had a little like startup party where the crew and the, with all the cast and all the crew uh, at the hotel where we were staying. And I'm a big believer in that stuff. I just think there's nothing better than, you know, throwing a little shindig and having people be able to spend several hours together sort of getting to know each other in a, in a non-pressurized environment. It mm -hmm. just helps. Then mm -hmm. you come onto the set and I say, hey, John, how are you? you know, mm -hmm. um, And they seem to, they just stepped right in. As I said, we were trying to start sort of uh, trying to shoot in sequence, and I think that helped a lot, too. So no, the auditions, such as they were, weren't auditions in the sense that no, no one was asked to ever act or improv no. anything. No. They were just interviews. And you, with your casting person, just based on instinct and the way they appeared, you knew that these people were going to work in these roles. Yeah, you're sort of, you're backfitting, uh, you're, you're, you're looking for a personality, you're looking for a type and a feeling knowing that you're going to you're going to plug it into the movie but they may not have had a knack for improvisational acting they they all turned out they all did but yeah i guess you you get a you know you watch a 30 minute interview with somebody you get a pretty good you get a pretty good sense of them at least i i felt like we did and and in this case all of the choices i think were the right choices i want to actually to jump back this is maybe a little confusing but there was an establishing shot of the house at night um that scene looked like it had to be lit i mean there were scenes were there any night exteriors where you had to bring in some sort of lights or no just the just kyle's trailer that green the light. trailer that's, that's what it. i meant yeah. yeah so that was lit yeah that we uh we had this one we had one light with us and um that area that we were shooting in where Kyle lived at night, um, there are no lights. Yeah, so you had no choice. You had no yeah. choice. So what I decided to do was, was instead of try and make it look real, I decided just to go in the other direction and make it a, a light, that it was obviously a light, and, the, and it was... But I bought it as it could have been some sort of... Some sort of source. Well, I tried to keep it consistent in terms of where it was coming from, and no matter where you shot it, that's where it was coming from. But it looked to me like one of those, almost like a live-action version of, you've seen some still photographers who specialize in shooting, like, flash photography at magic hour. Mm -hmm. You know, and it Gregory has... Gregory Crutzen. Yeah, and yeah. it has that really interesting Well, let me... Quality. That's a question I was just going to ask you. Were there, are there any um, influences or... Were there films that you were referencing, as you mentioned, Honeymoon Killers, but in terms of the style or the look of the film, were there photographers or filmmakers you were influenced well, I was, by? you know, I was watching a lot of the... Um, I, I mean, uh, somebody had mentioned when they saw the film, they said, oh, Joel Meyerowitz, um, which is absolutely true. As soon as they said it, I thought, oh, yeah, that's true. I have a couple of his books. Um, 
And then I was watching all this Fassbender stuff, mostly because he worked with non-actors a lot, and I was really trying to get a sense of how he was using them um, and the simplicity of them. And I remember when we were making Kafka, and I asked Armin Mueller-Stahl, who had worked with Fassbender a couple of times, I said, what was it like? Was he really as fast as people said? Um, and he says, oh, yeah. He said, you got one take. You got one take. And he said what was really interesting about it was after the, <laughs> after the initial terror of that, you just got used to it and knew you had to bring it yeah. on take one. If you know that you only yeah. have and one take. And he goes, and two. after a couple of days, you did. Like yeah. You just fell into that rhythm. And that was very much what I was trying to set up here. And there were, there were a lot of situations where we just do one take and, and move on. I also try, it's, ironically, since this is you know, going to be a movie that I think will be seen uh, as much on video as it is uh, in theaters, I really became enamored of these big tableaus, these big wide shots and playing things in, in wide shots, which is something you most people associate more with features, you know, big scale features. But I just liked... Um, I just thought the landscape that we were shooting in was really interesting. Now, now, in terms of the look of this particular scene, when Kyle's being interviewed by the detective, that lamp, did you place that lamp there? No. Did you put a, a, a brighter bulb in that lamp? No. No, we're, shooting, we're probably shooting wide open here. That's fantastic. With the HD cam, but I love the way it looks. Oh, yeah. It's, no, I mean, I feel like I would bring, I would bring a video if I have, if I'm shooting a film on 35 millimeter. I feel like I should bring one of these cameras to the set, and it's so beautiful what you what the the video camera gets with just the light that you have. And I would say to the cinematographer, I want it to look like this. <laughs> Got to look exactly like this because really, I think you'll probably agree. Although you shoot all your own films, so when you were working with cinematographers, even the best ones can occasionally overachieve. They just have all this equipment and they feel the need to use it. I think you're right in that you you end up, uh, in many cases on a movie, you've got all these people around and lots of lights and all the gear on the truck, and you just want it to look like you don't have any of that stuff. You want it to look like life. And you end up, you know, reverse engineering stuff to get it back to this place that's just simple. Well, Kubrick was the best at that. Yeah, he's the master at yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, he's considered the great visualist, and he, he would do everything in his power to make it look like it was lit by the sun or by a lamp. Yeah. Um, and so I find that, you know, these cameras, and as we know from our uh, uh, our colleagues, you know, the, the other uh, high-end digital cameras that are out there are, are very good. I mean, you can get really remarkable imagery. I, I find it's... it's it's his, it's its own aesthetic. You know, it's not video, it's not film, it's just, it's something else. And I, I treat it like that. There are times when you can take the, uh, the things that, the, the vagaries of, of that aesthetic and push them, you know, really far and come up with something that's really interesting and cool. And Did you watch other films that had been shot digitally too? Yeah, I had, and I wasn't really... Um, while you were there, you didn't I wasn't really happy with what I was seeing. There is one really stunning Michael Winterbottom's In This World. Oh, yeah, I did see that. It's a really incredible yeah, digital that film. That is beautiful. Yeah. Um, but most of the stuff I was seeing didn't look the way, I certainly didn't look the way I wanted this to look. Well, I think this is one of the most beautiful digital films that have, has been made yet. I think my problem with digital has always been that it. it, it Film seems to poeticize everything, which is good and bad, usually good. Whereas video tended to just be sort of flat information. But I also, but I think it's because people haven't learned how to use it yet. And this is one of the first films, and I think that Winterbottom film I mentioned, where you are starting to find the poetry in this technology, which people hadn't, I don't think it had been, it had been found yet. Well, I think, you know, you're going to see as, as it becomes more prevalent you're going to see more and more great stuff coming out of this this format